Well, over the past four weeks, we've been talking about who you're going to be in five years. When 2028 comes, who is the person you're going to be? And we've talked about dreaming really big and then thinking about some goals and then short steps that we're going to take each moment. But this morning, what I want to talk to you about is what if your vision for the uh, next five years uh, is changed? What if in the next five years, the vision that you have doesn't go as planned? What if that vision changes and it's different in some way, or maybe uh, it is failed in some way? You know, as I was thinking about my own life, the reality is, uh, most of my life, my plans have not worked out the way that, they, that I wanted them to. Most of the time, what I plan for, something looks very, very different. For example, when I was in elementary school, I went to Roseburg Elementary. And I loved Roseburg, mainly because we had three recesses every single day. We had one in the morning, we had one at lunch, and we had one in the afternoon. I'm not sure we learned anything, but we had fun in school. And I loved going to the gym, I loved going to the cafeteria. It was just a blast to be at Roseburg. And each year at the end of the year, kindergarten through fifth grade, there would be a graduation. And I was excited for that. And I was looking forward to my sixth grade graduation when I would walk across that stage. And then in fifth grade, in the spring of fifth grade, they closed our school. And my plan changed. In middle school, uh, my greatest desire was to be one of the 12 boys that would go to Indianapolis to play for a state championship basketball team championship. And so I put all of my energy, because I was at Marion, for the Marion Fighting Giants to be that person. And I made the team in my 7th grade and 8th grade year, and then I would go to different basketball camps. And one I would go to is the Bill Green Basketball Camp. Bill Green was the legendary coach. He won uh, eight state championships, and he was just considered the best coach. And he saw me in this camp, and he said, you know what? I think you can make the team. And so that entire summer, I worked hard, dribbling, shooting, everything. And then uh, in the middle of the summer, my dad came up and said, I feel like God is calling us to move to Anderson. And I remember thinking to myself, he may have called you, but he didn't call me. (laughs) And all of a sudden, we moved to Anderson. And what I had planned changed. When I went to college, the... My desire was to be a high school U.S. history teacher and to be a coach. That's what I wanted to be. I worked four years for this. I sent out dozens and dozens of resumes. I had interviews, and I never got the job. It was my plan to be a teacher, and my plan changed. After my wife Jennifer and I got married, and I think we have a picture of the stud that I was... I mean, how could you not marry a guy with a mustache and glasses like that? And our plan was we were going to get this small little apartment. We were going to live together. I was going to be a teacher. Everything was going to be amazing. But then after our honeymoon, we got back and we found out that she had been placed at the Muncie campus for IU Medical School. And I was living in Lafayette. And now all of a sudden the plan changed. In our first year of marriage, we didn't live together. I lived in Lafayette. She lived in Muncie. We only saw each other a few hours each weekend. It was extremely difficult. Jennifer went through a depression. It was not what we had planned. The plans changed. In January 2020, this place was moving, packing, everything. We were growing so much as a church at that time that we had decided that we were going to consider a third celebration. We started looking at buildings and at land, and then all of a sudden, March of 2020 came, the pandemic hit, and everything changed. And now all of a sudden, we're trying to do church differently like we hadn't done before. You know, sometimes, I don't know about you, but I wonder, why do my plans change so much? 
Can you relate? Sometimes you spend all this time and energy and effort trying to plan for something and then it turns out differently. Or maybe you plan for something and it actually fails. And you're like, serious, God, seriously? Have you ever planned on something and it just didn't turn out the way that you wanted it to? Maybe you're a student here today and you planned to get an A on the test and you studied as hard as you could and it got to the end of it and that's not what you got. You got a D or you got an F. Maybe you thought you were going to have this dream job that you were going to be, you're going to retire in and you have this job and it's there and then all of a sudden they downsize and you get axed and you don't have a job and the plan changes. Maybe you're in a relationship and some of you have gone through this or a marriage and you're like, this is going to be the one, this is going to be it. It's going to go all the way. We're going to be together forever. And then all of a sudden something happens. You're offended, they're offended, they're hurt, they betray you. Something takes place and the relationship ends. Maybe you were hoping to start a family, you and your spouse, and this is the way it was going to be. And then you tried for months and years and you never had a child. You see, folks, some of our plans over the next five years are not going to turn out the way that we had planned. They're going to change. They're going to be different. And some things might even be taken away from us. And this leads us to our big idea this morning. This is your first fill-in or on the app. You can join us and it's this. When plans change, focus on what can't be taken away. When plans change, you need to focus on what can't be taken away. Now, the truth is there are many things that can be taken away. Your job can be taken away. Your health can be taken away. Your wealth can be taken away. Your 401k, uh, your retirement account, uh, someone that you love can be taken away. Your very life can be taken away. Because when plans happen, folks, plans always change. So you've got to focus on that which can't be taken away. Now, the good news is we're not the first people to ever have this challenge before of plans being changed. If you look in the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Bible, what you'll see is that people are encountered by change all the time, that plans go different directions. And the key of every one of these stories is who is it that people choose to focus on? There's a story in the Bible of two sisters, one named Martha and one named Mary. And one day, their plans change, and what the key was is what they focused on. The story goes like this. As Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a village where a woman named Martha welcomed them. So one day, Jesus and his 12 disciples, 13 men all together, are walking to Jerusalem when they come to this village. And if you are a person of character in that day, in the ancient world, what you would do is you would provide hospitality for the stranger, for the person who is walking around. And so these guys walk, and Martha and Mary decide to practice some hospitality. Now, there are two kind of forms of hospitality that would be practiced. One is that they would welcome you into their house and they would wash your feet. So just imagine that. You have 13 men who have been walking 26 feet and now you have to wash them. And they smell and they're stinky and they're nasty from mud because most people either walked barefoot or they had sandals. And now all of a sudden, they're washing all 26 feet for these people. So you'd welcome them into their home, you'd wash their feet. The second thing you would do is prepare a meal. You'd want to wash your hands before you did that, though, right? Because you've been down in toe grit. And so they would do that. They would prepare a meal for them. But now they're not just preparing a meal for themselves, but for 13 men. And think about that. 13 men that you're going to have to prepare a meal for. So Martha immediately goes into plan mode, and she starts making a list. Do we have any list makers here? Yeah, 
Several of you. You like to have your list, get all the lists ready, and everything's ready. And maybe she made a list for her sister Mary, too. We don't know. But she's kind of like, you get the beans, you get the rice, you set the plates. I'll go ahead, and I'll get the meat ready, and I'll get the bread ready to go as well. And Mary's like, okay, sis, no problem. Then verse 39, it says, She, Martha, had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. Now, Maybe Mary didn't do her checklist. Maybe she left her sister high and dry to do it all herself. We don't know exactly what happened, but this is what we do know, that Mary sat at Jesus' feet. Now, at first glance, this may not seem like very much because you're like, okay, she sat at his feet, but this would have been controversial in biblical times. You see, only men were rabbis, teachers of the law, and only men would actually be followers or would be disciples. They would be the only ones who would ever sit at another person's feet. And now all of a sudden you got this controversy because you have this woman who is sitting at Jesus' feet, and yet Jesus allows it. In fact, Jesus had female disciples, followers of him who impacted the world in great ways. Jesus was always about elevating women and being able to make sure that women were a part of his team and that they grew in leadership. And just as a side note, we have some amazing women who are a part of the jar, who are great leaders who give of their time. And my hope is that for many of you, you will dream really big dreams as women over the next five years of what God's going to do in your life, how he's going to impact your life, and that there would be change that would happen from this. And most of all, in these five years, I hope you would be like Mary, and you would commit to sitting at Jesus' feet. Well, that's what Mary does. She sits at his feet. Now, in this uh, this story, a lot of times, uh, Mary gets a bad rap. People think, they read into it, and they'll go, oh, well, Mary was lazy, and Martha was the hard worker. But we don't know that for sure. Maybe the story was like this. Mary got all of her checklists done. She worked a lot faster than Martha. And when she saw Jesus getting ready to teach, she was so drawn that she goes immediately to him. Maybe that was the story. We don't know. But this is the one thing that we do know, is that Mary made Jesus the priority. Mary made Jesus the priority. The priority, and this is the thing, we need to prioritize Jesus over our priorities. We need to prioritize Jesus over our priorities. You see, folks, uh, over the next five years, uh, there are going to be a lot of things that you're going to have to work at. Have you ever had this experience before? You plan out your day and you're like, oh, I'm going to spend some time with God, but you don't at the beginning of the day. And you go through the entire day and there's nothing that happens. Why is that? Because you put your priorities over the priorities of Christ. And we're going to have a lot of work that we're going to be doing over the next five years. Men are going to be working. Women are going to be working. Kids are going to be working. There'll be school. There'll be work. There'll be relationships that are difficult that you're going to have to work through. But the key is, will you prioritize Christ over your own priorities? And it's hard to do. It's really hard to do. It's much easier, don't you think, to wake up in the morning and start watching ESPN? Or if you're, uh, you know, a person that likes HGTV or to surf the net or to do the dishes or all the other tasks that you have to do to prioritize everything and not Christ. But making him first and foremost might be the hardest thing that you and I can ever do in our day. Now, it wasn't wrong that Martha was making the meal. I mean, that was an act of hospitality. It wasn't wrong that she was doing it. It's just that in the midst of doing all of this, something happened to her that kept her from being at Jesus' feet. Verse 40 says this, But Martha was, and what's the next word? Distracted. What was she? She was distracted. Do you ever get distracted? 
And you get to the end of your day and you haven't had any time with God or the end of your week. She got distracted by all the preparations that she had to make. She came to Jesus and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do this all by myself? Tell her to help me. Can you hear the whining there? And then all of a sudden what happens is this prioritization changes and Martha puts food preparation over the one who she's preparing the food for. Here it is, the Son of God who's in front of you and she prioritizes that over actually being with him. She gets distracted. Verse 41, it says, Martha, Martha. Now let me just say this. If Jesus has to say your name two times, you're in trouble. If he says it two times, you're in trouble. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be, what's it say? Taken away. It will not be taken away from her. Mary chose the better option. I mean, even when plans change, Mary chose what couldn't be taken away. You see, what happened was, it was first just going to be a dinner for two, her and her sister, and Martha was like, oh my gosh, now it's a dinner of 15. How are we going to do this? But Mary focused on what could not be taken away. Around five years ago, uh, Don Richman, who's a good friend of mine and used to uh, serve as our student ministry director, was at the peak of her life in a relationship with God. Life was on the full. And she had recently gotten married. They'd had a child. Uh, She and her husband, Justin, everything was up and to the right. Marriage was good. Life was good. Everything was good. Her parents, who were disconnected from Christ and the church, started growing closer to God. Everything was going amazingly well. And their little daughter, McKenna, finally had grandparents that were investing in her in some amazing ways. And then... Shortly after she had started as our student ministry director, her dad was diagnosed with cancer, and seven months later, I officiated at his funeral. Just like that. The plans that she had had changed. It wasn't what she had planned. It had been taken away. And yet what... Don would do regularly, she would sit at Jesus' feet and saying, God, I can't get through this on my own, but I know that's one thing that can never be taken away. Well, as Don healed, and as her family healed, things started getting better, and then four months later, the unthinkable took place. Her mom, Donna, was diagnosed with cancer, and 15 months later, her mom died. And so in 19 months, both her mom and her dad had died, and the season of grief that she endured was overwhelming. Six months ago, Dawn went to a regular doctor's appointment. As the doctor met with her, the doctor said, hey, the same gene mutation that your mom had, you have, and we think it contributed to her cancer, so you have to go through surgery now. And now she's planning surgery for her own life, and she's battling some other health problems herself. And yet, when I talked with Dawn about all of this that she had not planned, that these changes were, were not what she had planned, She said, even though this has been the hardest season of my life, Chris, I've decided not to let the circumstances make me bitter or hopeless. And that's one of the things that I just love about her because she chose to sit at Jesus' feet. You know, I have a feeling that five years before her dad was ever diagnosed with cancer, that she would have never thought that's how plans were going to change. I bet in her own mind, she thought, you know what? I'm so excited that my uh, mom and dad are connecting closer to God and they can be a part of McKenna's life and they can grow up, uh, help her grow in that relationship. I bet five-year plans, I remember she had one for student ministry. This is what's going to happen, and we're going to do this, and this is what's going to be great. And there were five-year plans that she had planned, but things changed. 
And yet, because she loved Christ, it was a beautiful thing to watch her that in the midst of everything that was taken away from her, both of her parents, her own health being compromised, she chose to do the thing that could not be taken away, and that was to sit at the feet of Christ. Folks, in the next five years, in the next two years, in the next week, something may happen that you did not plan to go that way. And there are many things that you can't control, but you can choose to listen to Christ, to draw closer to him, to worship him. I mean, no matter what, even when you hurt, even when there are hurts in your life, you can choose to still praise and honor him. The truth is this, every single person in this auditorium and everyone on the stream right now, you cannot predict what the future holds. But when the storms of life come, when the challenges hit, there is one thing that you can choose. You can do it today and tomorrow and next week and next year and five years, no matter what changes. And this is your practical step that will help you when you can't hardly make it that can help you before something hits the fan. To stay above the fray of life is this, to set a time each day to come to Jesus. That's what you can do. No matter what else happens in your life, there's one step that you can practically take that will help you to stay above the fray. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. It doesn't matter how long it is, but you consistently do it. In fact, Jesus said this. He said these words, come to me, all who are weary and burdened. He said, come to me, all of you, if you're stressed out, if you're overwhelmed, if you're not sure you can make it, for every single mom who is barely able to get through it, every single dad who feels left out, every single man who's struggling with work, every single woman who's struggling with their occupation, every family trying to put it together, he says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He says, if you'll come to me, you don't have to do everything on your own. And even if things change, there'll be one thing that's never taken away. And that's your relationship with me. Folks, if you can just make that commitment to say, you know what? For me, I'm choosing. I'm choosing to set a time each day to come to him, then when the fray hits, you can go above it. You don't have to walk with it alone. And so now, as we go into life and we don't know what can happen, we need to be reminded that when plans change, we are to focus on what can't be taken away. Well, what is it that can be taken away? Your finances can be taken away. Your uh, car, your house, you don't pay your car payment, it'll be taken away, believe me. There are many things that can be taken away in your life, but the one thing that will never be taken away is your relationship with Christ. So here's my prayer. My prayer for you over the next five years is that whatever you're planning, whatever your dreams are, that God would bless it. That whatever you're going through, that God would bless where you're at and would give you thoughts for where you're going. My prayer is that in the next five years, that he would prosper you, that you would have peace as you walk through life, that your life would be full and fulfilling. That's my prayer. But my prayer is this also, that in the next five years, if something changes and it doesn't go as planned with your health, with your wealth, with your relationships, that you love God so much, that you set a priority for him, that even when things change, 
You'll choose to be with the one that cannot be taken away, and that's the one who knows you best and loves you most, Christ himself. Because again, like I said, your finances, your health, your wealth can be taken away. But the one thing that can't is the one who knows you most and loves you best, and that's Jesus himself. And so I pray that starting tomorrow, when you wake up, you'll set a time to make him the priority, that you would prioritize him over your priority and see him move in your life. Let's pray. Well, Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this time and for your word. Lord, we are just in awe of you from sharing communion today and being reminded of what you give to us, your very life. You're so good to us, God. We're so grateful and thankful for all that you bless us with. And today, maybe you're sitting there or you're on the stream and the reality is you're like, I want to set a time to meet with him each day, but it's hard, Chris. I get so consumed. I get distracted like Martha does. Sometimes it's easier for me to do things, to actually just stop and to be, and so I need God's help. And if that's you with no one looking around, but you're like, I need God's help to help me set a time to meet with him each day, I invite you to just raise your hand. God, help me to set that time. God, I pray for each person with a raised hand that you would help them today to set a time to meet with you tomorrow and each tomorrow after that. That just like Mary, God, that more than getting distracted by the things of this world, they would choose each day to sit with you. And God, when the storms of life hit or the plans change or something doesn't happen the way that we hoped, I pray that you would remind them that you are with them you are for them, that you walk with them. Lord, I pray that you would overwhelm each person here today with the fact that you love them so much that you love to spend time with them. And that when they do, that is the one thing in their life that no matter what else changes cannot be taken away. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, maybe the truth is for you, uh, you have been doing your own plan. You've been doing your own plan for a while, and it's like things are changing all the time, but it's not changing for the good. And so today, maybe what you could do is surrender to the one who has the best plan for your life. A plan where he says, I'll walk with you and you'll never have to do this life alone. And everything that you've sinned with, everything that you've ever done is totally forgiven and you are made new. And so today, if you're ready to receive God's forgiveness, if you're ready to come to the one who says, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I'll give you a rest that this world can't give you then I'm going to invite you in a prayer. Today, if you're ready to say, Jesus, I need that. I need your love. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. I need your rest. I'm ready to give my one and only life to you. Then I invite you to share a prayer with me just to repeat after me. But it's not one that you pray by yourself, but it's one that we pray together in community. And I invite you, if you feel comfortable, just to close your eyes and to repeat this prayer after me. Heavenly Father, Save me from my sins. Make me brand new. I believe you died for me so I could live for you. Today, I give you my life so I can find rest in you. Fill me with your spirit so I can know you, serve you, and follow you for the rest of my life. My life is not my own. Today, I give it to you. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.